The peace of God is more than the absence of conflict. It is the overwhelming experience of God's love, caring for us. It's something that we learn to trust when the rest of the world is falling apart. We hold on to the peace of God. One man who learned to do that very well was Paul. Paul Paul was a precocious kid from what we know about him. He was a very intelligent kid. He was raised in his faith. He was sharp. He went to the advanced high school for uh, kids back then. He went to learn from one of the um, rabbis who was a great teacher. And everybody was so impressed with him. Even Jesus was. Even after Jesus died on the cross, he stayed impressed by this guy. And this guy, being who he was, was anti-Christ. And so he uh, was on his way, um, sort of like going from here to um, Ossian. And he was on his way. He's got papers. He's going to arrest all of the Christians down there. And all of a sudden, he had an experience. And the experience was this. A voice said to him, Saul, Saul, and Saul was his real name. Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, at the very same moment, he was blinded. Psychiatrists, psychologists have tried to explain this as some sort of a traumatic blindness, a psychic break, whatever. All we know is he could not see. And so he's blind. He hears this voice saying, why are you doing this to me? And Saul, in his best mature voice, said, who are you, Lord? It's me, Jesus. And we don't know exactly what he was thinking, but you could imagine it was the Hebrew, Hebrew variation of, oh, crud. I am really in trouble. But Jesus said to this guy that he still was impressed by, he said, I want you to get up, go to town, so your people will take you there. When you get there, go to Straight Street, and there's going to be a guy there waiting for you. You go, and then we'll talk. Meanwhile, Jesus was also talking to the man on Straight Street who's going, Jesus, don't you know who you're talking about? This guy's a bounty hunter for Christians. I think we just better wash our hands of this guy and stand back. And Jesus says, say what? And the guy says, okay, all right, we'll do it your way. And so Paul show, Saul shows up, and the man heals his blindness. And Saul is so shaken up that he's not seeing the world he used to know, the world he was looking at on his way to town. Instead, he saw a whole new world. And at this moment, he began to change. Jesus had seen this in him. Jesus knows that people change all the time. Jesus knows that people change spiritually and we grow spiritually from the time we first say yes I want to be in the choir when I grow up until they're old enough to actually do it and then they find out they have to practice at it you do practice right yes 
they practice. Actually, I come in on Sunday mornings and I sit over there on the back row listening to them practice. And it is so cool. They are so good. They cut loose when no one is here. I mean, we've got soloists here who just sing. And this is how it happens. You start sort of quietly singing in the shadow of the other voices. And then as time goes by, you become more confident. You begin to sing out. And one of these days, Dr. North is going to look at you and say, do you want to do a solo today? <laughs> and in spite of the shaking heads, you go, yeah, yeah. Because God's going to give you what you need, when you need it, to do what God wants you to do. Paul knew that. But Paul had been on the other side of the fence. Now Jesus has him on this side, and he's saying, Paul, I want you to go to the rest of the world. I want you to go to a world that you don't know all that well, and I want you to tell them about me. And so Paul followed the path of many other missionaries who had already gone out to talk to the world. And he got to Corinth. Corinth is a little bit like Fort Wayne is to Indianapolis. It's, it's the center of the universe and it's part of the world. We are, we are who we want to be. And that means we're a little bit different than Indianapolis. And Corinth was different than Athens, Greece, or any of the other towns in the area. So Paul went there. Corinth was well known. You could come from anywhere in the world and find someone there who agreed with your arguments. Well, Paul went in, and he started talking at the local church. If you were ever a minister back then, you would not want Paul to come and talk to your church. He had an attitude. And this is what he said to the people in Corinth who had become Christians, who were risking their lives in the Greek world by becoming Christians and standing up for this Jesus. And Paul comes and he says to them, now of course, Put your own tone into his voice. I couldn't address you as spiritual. You were worldly. You were mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food. You weren't ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready for it. And you've got the people who are visitors that Sunday who are saying, why did we come to this place? And then Paul looks around and he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. And then he looked out at everybody like, why haven't you? And at this point, the trustees are going, oh boy. And then Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he ends with, and I will show you a more perfect way. Growing up, I would listen to the words of Paul and I would think, that guy's sharp. And on the other hand, that guy's a pain in the neck because he is so self-centered. It seems like every other sentence has I in it. He's telling you, I believe this. I do this. The Lord asked me to say this to you. 
And I think, what an arrogant cuss this guy is. And yet Jesus thought so much of him that Jesus essentially changed the rules to pull him in. Now, I do realize when I get to the pearly gates, Paul and some of his buddies are going to be waiting for me, saying, hey, Harris, before you go through over here. And he's going to tell me personally, with a lot of the personal pronouns, I, 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 I went through all of this so that people who had not gone through it could understand Jesus saw in this guy someone who started out a little messed up, and as he went through life, even though he continued a little messed up, Jesus said, this guy can translate me to people who would never listen to me. This guy grew spiritually. He's not perfect. He grew spiritually, and he's ready to share whether or not people like him. And so he's doing exactly what he's supposed to do. We grow like Paul. We don't become perfect. We stay self-centered. We are the imperfect people that Jesus grabs a hold of and says, come on, come to my side. I'm going to ask you to do something now. Hang on before you shake your head. Look at your navel. Your navel. Look at your navel and think back to when that was the center of your universe. For the first nine months of your existence, you're in the womb. And your connection to the outside world, to food, to blood, to oxygen, is that little tube connecting, that umbilical cord. And just when you're thinking, I've got the world figured out, I've seen every corner of my world, you get kicked out. You're not only kicked out, but you're cut off from that connection to the world. What you thought was God's perfect miracle is gone. God's perfect miracle didn't last forever. (laughs) Nine months and it's gone. So what are you going to do now? In your first 30 seconds of life, You're breathing air. You're breathing out carbon dioxide. The blood that used to go into you and back to your mama no longer does. It just stays and routes through you again and again. You are a miracle of God's creation, but a different miracle than you were just minutes before. This is the story of your life. Because all through your life, you are going to keep changing, you're going to keep growing, you're going to continue having experiences and interpreting those experiences in different ways. Every day, we change, but every once in a while we get stuck. And we're not quite sure. Sometimes it's our decision. Sometimes it's the situation we find ourselves in. But it's just like that in our spiritual lives. We're growing up. We're getting used to knowing about God by our experiences, by what the people older around us tell us. And we think, we know God. We go to Sunday school, especially when we're young. And we learn more and more about God. We need to be very thankful for our Sunday school teachers. We need to be very thankful for our 
um, children's church leaders because their responsibility is to translate into language that a child would understand what it means to be known by God. Now, over the years, Sunday school teachers have shared what the kids often say to them. And one teacher, who was probably late 70s at the time, said, Oh, did I have a class today? And I asked, what happened? And she said, well, there was a combination of, of crises and, and moments of learning. Okay, what happened? She said, well, the first question that came from the kid was, where does the world come from? And so we talked about that for a little bit, and we explained how God created all of the world, all of the universe. And she said, and that little guy looked me right in the eye and said, then where did God come from? Every Sunday school teacher has experienced that at one time or another. And she said, so we started talking about that. And then another little girl broke in and she said, she pushed me. And the other girl on the other side of the room, who could not have possibly pushed her, said, I did not. She pushed me first. And before the teacher could completely deal with that, someone else yelled, it's mine. No, you can't have it. And the teacher at 75, whatever, is starting to go, did I take my medicine this morning? And she's looking at the kids and it's sort of disintegrating whatever lesson they had. And then one child looked at her and said, why did Jesus have to die? And she said, you know, the amazing questions that came up that day, just like that. And she said, so they talked about Jesus and Jesus dying. And she said, just as they were about to go to prayer, one little girl looked up at her and said, I have to go potty. <laughs> yes, again. And so the teacher said, well, I'm not sure what got through to them today. But over the next year, some of those kids became acolytes in worship. Not only were they acolytes, but they sat quietly during the sermon. They were paying attention, and they'd go back and talk to their teacher who had retired by then, <laughs> probably wanting to go to the, the old Sunday school teacher's home. But they went back and talked to her, and some of them thanked her for answering their questions. They said, I know I was just a kid then, but you helped me understand Jesus. Now that doesn't happen all that often, so when it does, you got to hold on to that. But we go through that all of our lives. We go through that not only in Sunday school. If you look at the list of our Sunday school classes, you get the feel that there are different levels of experience, different levels of age, that people go to class where they can talk and learn and understand what it means to be spiritual at different ages. God creates us with the imperative to continue growing. Jesus himself put it this way, Grow in the grace and knowledge. May the Lord make your love, and remember Pastor Cheryl explained the different kinds of love. Now there's friendship, there's romance, there's the love that God loves us with. May the Lord make your love increase 
and overflow. Be perfect then, cleansing ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, and we will in all things grow up into him who is the head. And then from the end of uh, Paul's writings, even when he aggravates me, he continues to encourage me. He says, I have learned, there's that I again, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So keep going. Keep growing in Christ. Never think that because you're a certain age, you've got it all down. A friend of mine, Rex, Rex Miracle, used to work at GE, in case any of you recognize that name. He was their photographer. And he was early 80s when I met him. And we had many, many, many Bible studies together. He was one of my chief challengers. He knew the Bible frontwards and backwards, and he'd always go, well, Mike, that may be so, but what about... And there we go, off on another tangent. But Rex, around 85, came into my office one day and said, hey, finish the Bible again. And I said, well, how many times does this make for you? And he said, around 100, 102 times he's read the Bible. And I said, haven't you gotten that down by now? And he says, you know, every time I read through it, I get something different. He said, I think it's because I've never been 85 before. So I'm reading this as an 85-year-old, not an 84-year-old, and there are differences. And so today, remembering Paul, remembering Rex, we're going to look at your homework. And by the way, it stopped snowing, so we've got extra time. I was stalling till it did stop. This is your homework. And the good thing is you don't have to turn it in. It's, it's just between you and, and Jesus. Matthew 7.12. Do unto others what you would have them do to you. If someone strikes you on the one cheek, turn to him the other also. A new command I give you, love one another. There's extra credit on this one. As I have loved you, you must love one another. That's going a step deeper. Don't worry about your life. Don't judge. Forgive. You'll be forgiven. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Extra credit again. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You know who said all these things? Jesus. Jesus is wanting us to continue growing and not just come on Sunday morning and, and have someone explaining a scripture to you. Jesus wants you to experience it on your own. So in the next week, pick one of these. It's in your bulletin. Pick one of these and think about it, pray about it. Ask, ask Jesus. What were you trying to get across to me with those words? How am I supposed to, in my corner of the world, in 2019, at school, at work, in my family, how are we supposed to experience your word and grow deeper? This is between you and Jesus. Grow deeper. Be content with your life. Grow closer to Christ.
because there will come a moment someday when he will look at us, call us by name, and say, come on over. This is going to happen. What stories are we going to have to tell him about what it means to live in his world today? Let's prepare for the rest of the week, the rest of our lives, by remembering that our sins are forgiven as we forgive others.